Um, you're recording already? Yeah, and I don't know how to stop it from doing that. Um, usually there's the settings. And we've got seven people in there right this minute. All right, I'm going to start it up and then I'm going to minimize my screen and then we'll roll from there. Cool. Okay. Okay. All right. Good luck. You'll do great. Thanks. All right. Just going to hang tight for just a few more minutes, guys. Let some people join, okay? And then we'll get started. All right, everyone, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the Port Huron. Nicole is a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, a recovery coach trainer, a Narcan trainer and distributor, as well as a recovery coach manager for outpatient SUD treatment with Flint Odyssey House. Additionally, she has been the Secretary for Michigan Association of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors since 2021. Nicole works to advocate for clients with substance use disorders and as a person in long-term recovery with nine plus years free from substance use addiction. We ask that you please remain muted for the presentation. You can have your camera on or off, whichever is your preference. This presentation will be recorded and posted on the Flint Odyssey House YouTube channel. Only the live version today will be eligible for Macbeth educational credit. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat or save them until the end when we will have time for a question and answer. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we'll share a link to an evaluation survey. Completing this will provide you guys with your certificate of attendance. Also, if you guys would like a copy of the PowerPoint, if you guys can just throw your email up in the chat for me, um, I'll make sure after today's presentation that you guys all receive a copy of that as well. 
All right, um, I'm gonna put myself on mute and we're gonna give Nicole the floor. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Alicia, for all of the efforts that you and the Port Huron Odyssey House have um, put into these series. Um, it's been a lot of work um, and I'm really excited that um, Phil and Odyssey is gonna be able to provide these um, trainings for you guys. <clears throat> so my name is Nicole Straub. Um, I am a person in long-term recovery and um, God willing, this September, I'll be celebrating 10 years sober. Um, I started, like Alicia said, um, I started recovery coaching about seven years ago, um, and I completed my development plan for my CADC this year in um, February. So um, one of the things that um, was uh, is, has been a part of my personal journey as well as my professional is the exploration of multiple pathways of recovery. And so, you know, one of the reasons that, um, that this is a passion for me is is the, um, the opportunities that Pathways of Recovery have for um, changing people's lives um, and giving them um, a sense of community and some other things like that. And um, when I became a clinician, I was able to see how these Pathways of Recovery um, truly affect um, the dimensions of the ASAM. Um, and um, as clinicians, um, we, we, work, we work straight out of that um, uh, ASAM criteria as far as um, seeing the progress in our clients and you know appropriate levels of care, always wanting to you know increase the increase the um, the abilities of our clients in those dimensions. <clears throat> so, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation on PowerPoint. Um, I do take some moments to um, kind of engage and ask some questions. Um, I welcome um, the questions uh, throughout the presentation. Um, if you raise your hands, and then um, Alicia can call on people who have their hands raised. Um, she'll be, um, they'll be able to see that um, and uh, in chat. And so I will try my best to, to keep up with the chat. Um, Alicia, if you do see any um, major questions coming through in the chat, um, if you can um, let me know, um, we can try and address that as well. All right. So the multiple pathways of recovery sustaining long-term uh, lifestyle changes. And the biggest thing with that is the fact that these are some really difficult lifestyle changes that people make in recovery. Um, and, you know, the, the goal with pathways is that we can sustain them, right? We're, our goal is that we set them up with these, um, you know, these roads for these pathways for success. And we're hoping that they stick with them and have a lifelong journey. Um, I know that um, in my experience, um, it's a whole lot easier to stay sober than get sober. And so setting them up with that, sustaining them. So today's presentation objectives, um, we're gonna discuss the history of pathways, um, the purpose of pathways of recovery, uh, the difference between pathways to recovery and pathways of recovery, uh, types and frameworks of pathways, um, the, the big thing um, in the last three years has been virtual meetings, and there's been lots of discussion and benefits of both in-person and virtual meetings. And then, of course, we're going to discuss lots of examples of pathways, and I will encourage you guys, if there's anything that, um, that I don't cover that you want to share um, today to broaden my horizons and everybody else's, I, I welcome that. Um, and then the last thing I have is some resources and local information on access, accessing these pathways. Um, I created this PowerPoint presentation to be interactive. There are hyperlinks throughout the entire presentation. So you're going to get a lot of information today. And so um, if you are interested in receiving a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, please um, go ahead and put your email in the chat. Um, Alicia will be able to send you um, a copy of the presentation because the links, the hyperlinks throughout the presentation um, will take you right to um, much more information than we have time to cover. All right, so the history of Pathways of Recovery. So before 1935, the medical and the psychological communities looked at addiction as a moral deficiency and deemed them insane. Treatment included inpatient psychiatric hospitalization and shock treatments, and, and with little to no follow-up. Um, they, they pretty much said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna keep you from being crazy and 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 stabilize you, and then we're gonna let you go, and you're gonna be fine. And they they had found that obviously that that just wasn't gonna work. Um, the first pathway outside of inpatient hospitalization was Alcoholics Anonymous. 
and it was born in 1935. They released a book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in 1939. And this created a way for people for the first time to sustain their recovery outside of a hospital with people who have been through the same addictions as them and found a way to stay sober by helping others do the same. And that, and that was a huge thing that, um, that they did. Not only did they create the 12 steps, but they also created this peer support system, um, which you know, I personally look at um, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson as like the first recovery coaches, right? They figured out that peer support was the magic besides a lot of the other um, things that they did with the steps. Um, in 1953, um, Narcotics Anonymous was allowed to revise the 12 steps to create a second pathway of recovery. From there spawned a revolution of support for people with any type of addiction um, to sustain an improved lifestyle on a peer level with and without the use of clinical interventions. And we, you know, there's a lot side of a lot of what we call process addictions um, that use the 12 steps today. And so, um, you know, like I say, it starts, a it started a revolution. These steps were getting used for all kinds of stuff. And Narcotics Anonymous was a nice change for those that were afflicted by things a um, little bit more serious than alcohol. And they maybe didn't feel comfortable being in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because, because um, AA considers it uh, in the textbook a strange, a strange alcoholic was the ones that had um, that had uh, afflictions other than alcohol, and so Narcotics Anonymous really started focusing on the lifestyle of an addict as opposed to the lifestyle of an alcoholic. So today there are thousands of support groups for people recovering from a variety of process addictions, including but not limited to substance use. All right. So um, let's talk for a minute about the purpose. Like what's the point of a pathway? And, and for, for those of you that may be in recovery, I think that this is, um, this is redundant for you. And so bear with me. But those people that aren't in recovery, understanding that like, especially when you're a clinician, you're looking at cause, the cause, causes and conditions of a substance use disorder and treating that with mental health, with, with um with all the different therapeutic inter um, interventions and techniques that we use to help people and understanding that like there needs to be more. Um, and, and yes, people go through treatment and then they don't use pathways and they stay sober. It absolutely does happen, but it's very rare. And so um, we're gonna talk about why, why should you, why should we suggest pathways of recovery to our clients? So to teach the client, number one is to teach the client self effort Advocacy and less dependence on substance use counseling and treatment. I have this saying with a lot of my clients, both counseling and coaching, I want to teach you how to live without me. I want to be able to teach you to use the community resources and, and resources within yourself to not need to be with me, teach you how to fly right out the nest. So number two is to continue building coping skills as they face life challenges and long-term recovery after they've completed treatment right? The title is to sustain it, sustain those lifestyle changes that they've made, put all that work into in a couple of years of recovery. Like we want to help them be able to sustain those. Number three is to assist the client in finding healthy peer groups so they can build lifetime, lifelong, um, long-term friendships and use throughout their lives. You know, it is very hard um, when you first get sober that they tell you, you got to get, um, stay away from, from your old friends. And so you eliminate um, sometimes everybody you know from your life and are left with no support. And so teaching them how to build those support systems um, is a huge part of what gets, what gets people through those first few years of recovery. Uh, number four is to help the client use resources in the community. By teaching them how to, how to plug into the meetings and giving them the websites and the apps and all those things for them to find meetings themselves, they get a better sense of community and they get, a, they get to be a part of the recovery community. Um, I think it's the difference between being in a meeting and at a meeting um, is really just getting in those um, pathways. Um, number five, for the client's social self-care and peer support. And so we understand 
And the SAMHSA's Eight Dimensions of Wellness talks about that social wellness category. And it is very common for people in, in early stages of recovery, well, actually at any stage of recovery, to get through some bouts of, of isolation. And so being able to focus on that social wellness dimension of SAMHSA's um, Eight Dimensions of Wellness, this, this pathway of recovery thing really does help them with that. And so um, also to prepare the client for completion of treatment, by helping to cover the dimensions of ASAM. So when a client comes into treatment and we do an ASAM um, assessment on them, we're looking at these six dimensions and we're placing them in a level of care. And so our goals are to progress that client in those different dimensions so that eventually like ultimately would be zeros, right? And they wouldn't need, wouldn't need treatment anymore, which I, I understand is not gonna happen. They're still gonna always leave treatment with some things they need to work on. But the goal is to get the, to eliminate a lot of those barriers and be able to improve those dimensions. And so completing treatment, if you were to look at your ASAM, being able to complete treatment would be able to cover those needs, right? So what I did was I sat there and looked at the, the dimensions of the six dimensions of, of ASAM and I broke them down and made questions out of them. So when you're talking about completing an outpatient treatment, you're looking at saying like, what, what can we do to improve each one of those dimensions? And so I created something that I use with my clients, which a lot of times when we do a treatment plan, I'll say, you know, you're coming up on a completion. So what do we need to do over the next three months before you complete treatment? that will allow you to improve those areas? Is there anything that we haven't covered that we still need to? And so we do that ASAM um, worksheet. And so um, I kind of have created this document and it looks through each one of those dimensions. And what I really wanna focus on today with multiple pathways is looking at some of those questions and how recovery coaches especially can affect those, um, those different dimensions by putting multiple pathways into their lives. And will they be able to take care of and improve these different dimensions? The biggest dimension that you'll notice for recovery coaches and um, uh, our, our coordinator, uh, clinical coordinator for Port Huron Odyssey House, uh, Ken Kubelman, says it perfectly when he says, recovery coaches like own that sixth dimension. Um, and so we are, that's what we live for is to look at some of those different areas in that um, sixth dimension and say like, what can we do to improve those? But multiple pathways can also really help um, the other dimensions when you're talking about like dimension five, when they're looking for coping skills, right? When they want to mo motivate through the stages of change, the 12 steps will actually help you go through the stages of change. Um, and uh, and, and it, it, it literally matches up with the different um, steps as they work the steps, for example. So what's the difference between when I say pathway of or pathway to recovery? Um, I did get this information out of the CCAR manual. Um, and if you have taken the, the five-day CCAR class, this, this should look a little familiar to you. So um, pathways to and of. And the pathways to recovery are basically anything that is, that is meant um, to stabilize addiction only. So you've got your criminal justice systems, right? Um, we call it the nudge from the judge. And then family interventions. Homelessness is a, is a pretty good pathway to recovery. We do get some people coming in. You'll always see the spikes in, in, um, in um, enrollments in the, in the colder months, right? And then of course, overdoses. Um, programs like MORT and um, are able to take a look at some of these overdoses and, and help people get motivated for treatment. But as much as the difference that Mork specifically the, um, is doing in Port Huron, they're not gonna be able to sustain somebody's recovery from an overdose, right? So they are a pathway to recovery. Um, anything that's considered externally motivated um, is considered a pathway to recovery. So your children, um, you know, saving their relationships. Um, the engagement at this point is based on, on consequences that the try, client is trying to avoid. So when you're trying to look at um, detox, residential, um, a lot of those different levels of care, they're, they're based on consequences that the, try, the client's trying to avoid. And like I said, any intervention or level of care meant to stabilize addiction only, just stabilization. So this basically sums up that pathways to recovery 
or any intervention that is not sustainable long term. So if you can complete it, it's not sustainable, right? Now, when you look at to take a look at the pathways of recovery, these are permanent support groups or modalities that can continue for a lifetime. Something that that client can continue to do um, long after treatment isn't something that's a part time or a short short term type of solution. Anything that's considered internally motivated and meant to sustain and support a healthy lifestyle. So you'll see that some of those different things that brings a client into treatment gets them here. And one of our jobs as coaches and clinicians and any part of that treatment process is to help that client become internally motivated. Take that any type of motivation, right? Any reason for them to get here, take that in, in, um, and help them become internally motivated. Um, the other thing that it does is it builds client self-efficacy -effic and less dependence on that treatment process. Um, the more that they have sponsorship and peer support, um, they're going to call us and need us less. They're going to be able to go to their peers and their fellowships and, and, and have support from them as well. Client is stabilized already. Now we're at this point, client is stabilized and in or working on being in the maintenance stage of change. And of course, any intervention that is sustainable or long-term. So I just want to give just a minute and see if um, this crowd has um, any any pathways of recovery that you guys want to recommend. Any pathways that you guys might know? Any, um, maybe something that's one of yours? Continuing education. Continuing education, like education just going to school going back to school or figuring out a trade or something like that to to focus on um okay so i mean i suppose if like um you know positive self um self develop like personal self development um and education the only thing i would challenge is that it's not really sustainable because you can't stay in college forever um although if you're looking at positive self development like like personal reflection and constantly looking at the things that you want to improve in your life, and that's a kind of like a technique that you use, then um, self-reflection and self-development would would probably be something that you could sustain long-term. Would, would that kind of fit what you were saying? Yes, investing in yourself in that way, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Good ideas. I'd like to add, um, with me, I took a pretty much non-traditional route because I worked inside of residential treatment. Okay. Like you, um, I, I've been CCAR since 2016 and MDHHS since March of last year, just July 4th, I celebrated 10 years recovery. Yes, excellent. However, I have never been to any NAAA or whatever meetings. However, I got my treatment working inside of treatment. So whereas my employer thought I was showing up because I was this great employee, I was showing up because I was learning about me. I was facilitating groups. I was listening to people talk. So I worked in that environment, that same environment, almost 20 years. And I touched thousands of lives. And likewise, they've touched mine. And I've been a part of each and every one of them. That alone helped me sustain my recovery because I was showing up. I was learning about myself. I was seeing people become honest, get honest with themselves, not afraid and not ashamed. So I learned that to help me. And then I passed it along and wanted to become a recovery coach in that sense. So I don't know if that's something you would agree with, but it has worked for me. And I've been able to keep 10 years um, after several lapses, um, but just showing up and listening to other stories and recognizing, hey, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only victim here. Yes, thank you for that, and congratulations on ten years. That's amazing. Thank you. thank you. Um, and I and I and I would probably um I would probably poke you a bit to say that um there was probably some outside support systems that you had to build um besides your job itself, um church, um uh, other people in recovery. There was probably some type of fellowship or support system that was built. Um, and I, I'm guessing um outside of your work atmosphere. You're, you're muted. Oh, there you so go. with that being said, it was like really quick here. I'm going to sum it up in 30 seconds. Um, 
it it was that. What happened was during that time, I was not paying for cable. You needed a converter box to watch TV. I was not, um, Radio Shack didn't have any more in stock. I couldn't find any. So I went to the library. This is how long ago this was. I went to the library and, and checked out self-help books, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, those types of people. And they referenced to Bible scripture. So what happened was as I went to work, heard all these stories inside this thing was stirring up in me. I would come home, eat, shower, get in bed with my books. And then I would look forward to this. So I would reference the Bible, reference this. And then this supernatural feeling just came over me that there is a higher power. And now my thing is, and I, co I coach um, and I tell people everything happens for a reason. And I only say this to the people that I know are believers. I said, nothing happens by mistake. Everything that we went through. No, when you're a kid, nobody says, I want to do drugs. But the situations that we were placed in allowed us to go through these things to figure out who we are. So yes, there was some outside sources. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so it's that sense of community and part of something and um, that, that really does it. And, and so I appreciate that story. Thank you very much. It's Shalita. I appreciate that. Um, so, um, Misty mentioned in the chat, she's got AA, NA, Celebrate Recovery, Smart Recovery, Dharma Recovery, um, and, um, Miss, and she also talked about like, like you were saying, Shalita, volunteering, being of service, right? And so we're going to kind of break some of those down for you guys right now. Um, and, um, and there are some different frameworks that right away that you'll notice in some of these different pathways. So the types and frameworks we talk about are there's three major ones of the types. You've got abstinence-based, complete and sustained cessation of one's own primary drug of choice, and other non-medical psychoactive drugs and or gambling. And um, luckily for me, nicotine and caffeine are um, historically accepted. <laughs> um, moderation management. Uh, moderation management is a pathway that works for some people and it doesn't work for everybody. And usually people will try it and it either will work or they'll know it's not for them. And it's literally the sustained deceleration of alcohol and other drugs um, to and or gambling to a subclinical level. So they stop meeting the criteria for a substance use disorder. So that's that difference between use, misuse and abuse, right? They can actually decelerate their use down to a subclinical level. And then the third major one is the medication assisted recovery. Um, the use of medically monitored pharmacological drugs to support recovery from addiction. And then you'll also see that as we break down these pathways, there's kind of a framework. So they kind of go with religious, spiritual, and secular. And so your religious, people who really identify with their faith and a specific type of faith, being able to combine that re with recovery has been exceptionally powerful for a lot of people. And so there are specific, um, there are specific pathways that allow you to combine that um, with their religious experiences and beliefs. Spiritual is, um, it's more of a framework that um, it says it flow out of the human condition or wounded imperfection. It involves experiences of connection with the resources within and beyond self and involves a core set of values and principles. So maybe not specifically into a religious, um, a religious denomination, but it's more that connection. They're looking more at just the connection and maybe not the entire um, pathway. And then you've got a lot of secular groups. And this is good for a lot of those people because I've seen a ton of people and I'm sure you have that come into recovery and they've got resentments against God or they've got some disconnection with, with a higher power. And they are not interested in hearing about the God of your understanding. And so being able to know that there are several secular groups um, that does not involve reliance on a religion or higher power um, is a great resource to be able to offer our clients. So um, when you're talking about meetings, because that's pretty much what we're saying is, is a lot of these pathways, they, they have support meetings, okay? And so in 2020, um, 2020 this, just, this just blew up. And then some of the things that we're finding are people are saying, which one's better than the other? Well, I say there's benefits to both. And I don't think that um, in-person <clears throat> meetings are ever going to be replaced. But I do think Zoom or um, online meetings are probably here to stay. So the benefits of an in-person meeting. And let's just be real, there's 
three years worth of people getting sober that very well have never been to an in-person meeting. And the convenience of it, they literally don't even know what they're missing. And so some of the things that I wanted to highlight on in-person meetings, one, easier to focus on the speaker, less distractions. Um, people are walking around cleaning their house and folding their laundry while they're doing meetings. And so being at a meeting is definitely less distractions. Uh, number two, getting to know peers on a personal level, um, the meeting after the meeting. Really powerful stuff. Encourages social self-care, that social dimension of wellness we talked about. More accountability and effort towards their own recovery. Kind of like when you save the money and buy your own car, you take better care of it as opposed to if somebody gives it to you, right? Number five, making more effort towards the recovery creates more reward for themselves. Six, experience the energy in a room full of people with a common cause. Just that the energy that's created when you are all in the same room, you are all focusing on trying to make it, get yourselves better and healthier. Um, and then number seven, increases the stability of social support in the ASAM dimension six, like we talked about. Um, before 2020, there were very few meetings of any kind online. People had to travel and make the effort to seek out their recovery, which produced more fulfillment. The rooms were filled with personal welcomes, hugs, and handshakes, and literature was available to borrow or buy. So helping your clients be able to see that yes, any meeting is better than no meeting, but there are some serious um, benefits to an in-person meeting. But we have also discovered lots of benefits to the, to the, to the virtual side of, of recovery. So the, the couple that I was able to come up with is one, eliminating barriers to recovery support due to childcare, medical issues, social anxiety, and transportation. Those mentioned are very common, as you know, barriers to get people to come to treatment, to go to meetings. And sometimes they continue to stay in addiction because they do not have access to the meetings and the treatment that they need. And so being able to overcome some of those barriers, people are getting sober and staying sober and never stepping foot in a meeting, which um, I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for um, at least 10 years. And I can't imagine not being able to connect to my people, but, um, but you know, it's for us to encourage them. Um, number two, access to pathways that are not available locally. I had so much fun exploring pathways to recovery online during COVID. Um, I, mean, I don't know if anybody else did, but there were so many pathways of recovery that are not listed anywhere in my area or possibly not even in my state that I never would have been able to see what those pathways were like until, until they started popping up left and right on Zoom. And so if you have a client that is looking to check out something and it sounds interesting and maybe they don't want to invest the time to go, they can check out a Zoom meeting and, and see if they're even interested to find an in-person. Uh, number three, international or 24-7 meetings available at all times, every hour on the hour. If you were to Google AA meeting marathons, NA meeting marathons, it would give you list after list of 24-7 every hour on the hour meetings. And I, you know, I'm up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, or it's three hours before my next local meeting. You know, and these really do give people a chance to plug in right away. Um, number four, gives clients a chance to research pathways and discover what they might be interested in. Um, and number five, it offers camaraderie of, of recovery with people all over the world. I, I want to also one of the benefits of doing these during COVID was that I was in a, an AA women's meeting that was international. And I am listening to this lady from Ireland with her accent, talk about the same literature that I read in my local meetings. And it really just gave me you a sense that recovery is a is a worldwide thing it's not just my area it's all over the world so before 2020 there were a few pathways offering meetings online COVID-19 shut down all in-person meetings taking away millions of people's tools to stay sober AANA and many of the other pathways quickly devised a zoom schedule to continue support that was saving the lives of people in recovery now that meetings are opening up, virtual is still available for people 
that still experience barriers to treatment. Some say that virtual is here to stay. So it, it's looking like that if you guys, um, I'm sure you guys will agree. So we did discuss some of the examples of pathways and I think you, Misty, you had some good ones there. Um, and so we're gonna talk about some of these pathways. Um, the biggest one that you hear about the most often is the 12 step pathway. Um, and a lot of times I, I think that um, we forget that this 12 step program has been adopted by like so many different fellowships. So groups that have their own variation of the, the original 12 steps of AA were, that were formulated back in 1935. Each group modifies the wording to fit their specific primary purpose. So their primary purpose has to do with the specific um, topic that their meeting is about. Anonymous refers to respecting other people's anonymity. What is said here stays here. And it's acceptable for people to speak on their own recovery outside of a meeting, just not others. So you can tell stories of that you heard, but not talk about those people. So a lot of times people that are not in recovery, the anonymity is not that I can't say I'm in AA so much as represent Alcoholics Anonymous um, on, on that basis. Um, most 12 step groups are based on complete abstinence. And this is where people who are um, choosing some moderation management or some harm reduction tend to really struggle with these types of fellowships because you're not gonna change a hundred year old fellowship and ask them to, to start accepting these different pathways. They are abstinence based, but understanding that there's tons of other pathways for them, we can plug them in somewhere. Um, these groups are ran on pretty much similar formats. They allow members to share once for like three to five minutes, and then they encourage what they call no cross-talking. So it's not um, engaging or interactive. We're not, um, we're not gonna answer each other's questions. If you wanna provide support, um, then you need to do that before or after a meeting. And helping your clients know what these expectations and etiquettes are before they go in will probably help them prepare and feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, these meetings are led by a volunteer or chairperson. So it's just a trusted servant um, they, they, uh, they're not a paid facilitator. Um, open meetings welcome people with or without addictions to attend. So if you see on an AA or an NA um, uh, meeting sheet, um, when it has the list of all the meetings, if it says closed meeting, it just means that they only allow people with addiction to the meeting's primary purpose. So you anybody can attend an open meeting. And the closed meetings are just for people who are in recovery from that from that um, primary purpose. So some of the most common, you've got your AA, your NA, you've got cocaine anonymous, dual recovery anonymous for people that are dual diagnosed. This is really neat and quite powerful for them to be able to look at both diagnoses at the same time. Um, Medication assisted recovery anonymous, MARA, I think is one of the the um, best secrets going on. This is a 12 step program for people on medication assisted recovery programs. So abstinence is not the key. It's not doing their drug of choice. It's, it's recognizing and reducing stigma for people who are on Suboxone, Methadone, Vivitrol, any type of me uh, medication assisted recovery. I have heard of people who use marijuana as a medical purpose being able to, to utilize these uh, medication assisted, the MARA. Um, there's a group called Pagans in Recovery. Um, Codependence Anonymous, of course, is a, and, and this is a really common one for our, um, for our uh, as substance use disorder clients to be able to double up on this Codependent Anonymous. Um, Overeaters Anonymous, uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics is similar to Al-Anon, but it really focuses on, on being raised in a family, not parents, grandparents raised in a family with alcohol. And then you've got Al-Anon, Gamblers Anonymous, um, Sex Addicts Anonymous. And it, does anybody know any other 12-step programs besides what I mentioned? Okay. All right, so now we have smart recovery. And so Misty mentioned this. 
Smart recovery, just to kind of um, just to kind of touch base on smart recovery. One of the biggest things is that it's secular. So um, that is a huge bonus for those that are really still struggling with the idea of, of a higher power. Um, talking about God, if they, you know, if they're still hanging on to the, the God of their childhood and they just have those resentments, instead of just trying to get them to become spiritual, invite them into this. And the other part is the smart recovery is those people that are very, um, very detail oriented, they're very cog CBT, very like that's the way that they're responding. Adding this to their recovery program is an exceptional help to them. If you're looking at behavioral management, behavioral modification, um, this is a great pathway for people. And I do want to point out that giving them options in several different fellowships is wonderfully acceptable. Um, I enjoy Codependent Anonymous as much as I do Alcoholics Anonymous. And people can also attend both. Smart Recovery isn't just for people who don't believe in God. It's somebody who really has that psychological brain. They're really, really responding well to CBT. And this is a great fellowship for them. And so it's it's a community and it's it's facilitated by a trained facilitator. So you can um, I know that um, for you coaches, um, MDHHS coaches, um, they are offering a smart recovery facilitator training and um, you can get credits for taking the training and you can start your own smart recovery meetings. And we don't have enough of these around. So. Um, if you need a nudge from me, let me know, because we really do need more of these in town. Um, but the, the online community is pretty big, the, um, the online community. Um, Women for Sobriety is a neat organization that, that, that started out to really just focus on, um, um, like focusing on and helping women um, bond together and the challenges with um, drugs and alcohol and recovery. You know, there's a lot of talk about parenting, and, and just like self-care and things like that. And so this is its own recovery community. Again, we can combine those pathways. Life Ring Secular Recovery. So this has been around for quite a while. Um, it, uh, it's, it's an organization of people who share practical experiences and sobriety support. There are as many ways to live free of illicit or non-medically in, um, indicated drugs and alcohols, there are stories of successful sober people. Many Life Ring members attend other kinds of meetings or recovery programs, and we honor those decisions. Some have had negative experiences in attempting to find help elsewhere, but most people soon find that Life Ring's emphasis on the positive, practical, present day can turn anger and despair into hope and resolve. Life Ring respectfully embraces what works for each individual. And so I really like this for people who are not meeting makers. I don't like meetings. I don't want to do meetings. Um, I don't need meetings. Well, this is more just like a recovery community, right? They're just supporting each other. So one thing I did, did put on here is that all of the meetings on their website are in Pacific time zone. So remind your um, clients that um, to, to take a look at that. I don't want them to miss those. So they are secular, um, and um, I just really find that um, getting somebody to try anything. Um, the other thing is, if you are in recovery and you have not really explored a lot of these pathways, I really urge you to click on some of these links, um, these hyperlinks, and check out these pathways. Even jump in and attend a meeting. Um, check the meetings out, and then you will be able to prepare your client, give them a little bit better idea of what it's like for them. And I think that's one of the reasons why clients don't go <clears throat> is the unknown. They just don't know what to expect. And um <clears throat> and I, I find that to be I find that to be a challenge for a lot a lot of our, our clients. So I wanted to ask you guys a question <clears throat> before we go any further. What do you guys find is the biggest reasons why your clients do not want to go to meetings or they don't want to try new meetings or maybe you don't want to go to meetings. What are some of those reasons why, why you hear that people don't want to go to meetings? They say things like, uh, I get there and, uh, you know, listening to these people gives me urges to drink. Yep. <clears throat> Definitely. I've heard that one. Nicole. 
I think the biggest ones I've heard have been people who struggle with religion. So either that have had bad experiences growing up or also maybe are, you know, atheists, don't believe in any kind of religion, struggle going to meetings. And also I've had people mention about, um, similar to what the last person said, but like people who will be there that are under the influence and they understand that that's the best place for them to be, that, but that that can be triggering for them to see people there under the influence. Okay, good ones. Shalita. Shame and embarrassment. All right, those are some really awesome ones. Um, I definitely um, uh, can, I have heard these myself. And so you can see that, and some, we're gonna go into a couple more, um, but being able to have them be honest with us about what the struggle is, and obviously pushing meetings on people doesn't work, right? But introducing them to options. And I really think that the virtual online option is great when you're talking about um, uh, seeing people, seeing people under the influence. Well, maybe, you know, we need to take a look at uh, getting to some online stuff that might actually really help. Um, the other thing is, I have a saying, and you guys are welcome to steal this and use it, is I really truly believe that meetings are like McDonald's. And I ask my clients, and some of you have taken my coach training, have heard this one. Have you ever been to McDonald's? And they say, of course, I've been to McDonald's. And I say, have you ever been to a McDonald's that was terrible? They got your order wrong. They were rude. The, the ice cream machine's broken. I mean, that's most of them. But, you know, it was just an awful experience. And you're like, I am never going back to that McDonald's. You guys all in your head right now know the McDonald's you will never go to again, right? Did you stop going to McDonald's? Of course not. We just found another McDonald's. And that's my whole theory on multiple pathways of recovery is there are some meetings that are terrible, whether it was just the vibe in the room, whether it's the way that the facilitator ran it, whether it was the people with their major issues that were taking over the meeting and making it something other than recovery, whether it was, I watched a guy at an AA meeting once, he said he was sober and that he, his wife made him clean up all the beer cans in the backyard. And he goes, watch this and walks out of the meeting, grabs a huge bag of beer cans from his truck and brings it into the meeting. So yes, there are some crazy things that happen in meetings, but it's like McDonald's, just don't go to that one find another one. And so being able to help them with these different barriers um, and finding something different um, and a different vibe, a different experience, I think giving them the options is really a lot about what, what it's about. Thank you guys for that. So um, this is, an, this is uh, something I discovered also during, um, during COVID. And this is an actual meeting app. Um, so you can download this app on your phone. And um, so it says that the forum has a thousand rooms and various topics. And so what my um, my experience was is that when you log in and you sign into this account and you sign into this, um, you get an account and you get to choose different meetings. And it's literally not just for recovering addicts. It's for um, codependents. There's all kinds of meetings. So this is a recovery community of all kinds of different recovery. So these guys started this and it's just gotten huge. Um, so the, they, um, the biggest thing was is to have it, have it accessible to you. So it said the basic concept has grown into a global online community with over 900,000 members who share their strengths and experience with one another daily. Through live meetings, there's discussion groups and all kinds of other tools in the in, in within the in the rooms um, from around the world. And a lot of people really like this because they can communicate and do discussion boards with people in recovery back and forth, not just the actual meetings. So this thing, this thing really took off. It was already going on long before COVID, but it was really taken off after COVID. Um, and I saw, um, I saw that Misty put in recovery Dharma. So I will give you a little bit of background. Recover Refuge Recovery came out um, a few years ago, and there was some, there was some differences between um, recovery Refuge Recovery and Recovery Dharma. There was some 
basically some drama that went around with the um, the creator of recovery, a refuge recovery. And the biggest difference, honestly, between the textbooks and the programs is that recovery dharma is peer led, whereas refuge recovery is facilitator led. And so a lot of the clients really seem to enjoy the, the obviously the peer led going back to the all the way back to the 30s with Alcoholics Anonymous, that one person, you know, one addict and alcoholic alcoholic help in another. Recovery Dharma is an amazing, is an amazing um, uh, recovery tool. And it has a lot to do with substance use, but they do reference addiction in general. Um, so any type of um, addiction, they even talk about like codependency. So it's a peer led movement and community that's unified by our trust in the potential of each of us to recover and find freedom from the suffering of addiction. They really focus on, instead of saying addiction, it's suffering. We believe that the traditional Buddhist teachings, often referred to as the Dharma, offer a powerful approach to healing from addiction and living a life of true freedom. So we believe that recovery means empowerment. So they're talking about instead of suffering, they're teaching empowerment. And what they do is um, they focus on the principles, um, some Buddhist principles. Um, the nonprofit um, Recovery Dharma, we commit to taking tangible and concrete actions to support the inclusion of all members of this worldwide Sangha. Our board of directors are democratically elected by the global community and serve as volunteers. So some of their responsibilities, they do the developing, publishing and distributing of all the material. Um, and you know, this the, they really do take a look at what the needs of the community are. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about, I don't know if anybody's ever been to a recovery Dharma meeting, but um, there's several in a couple different areas. Um, Genesee County recently got ours back up and running. It was going on in Davison, and then we closed down for um, COVID and they just opened it back up. Port Huron. Um, I know BW Rock offers Recovery Dharma, and they have quite the setup. It's pretty zen, um, but it's a really neat where they actually include like a 10-minute meditation and reading some of the material from the book, and then a discussion on on what you're about, you know, a discussion and feedback on the meditation, as well as um, the material in the book. And so um, it is a it is very it's a very inclu very inclusive recovery group. Um, and so they, they are supportive of multiple pathways in most ways. Any thoughts or comments on a couple of the ones I um, just went over? If anybody's been. All right. <clears throat> so celebrate recovery and free indeed. <clears throat> so if you have somebody who is um, faith-based, church, God, that's their pathway to recovery. That a lot of times could be enough for somebody that their faith alone in their in their church. And a lot of times, like I was mentioning to Shalita, it's about the community. That's a pathway in itself, the community. And so being able to combine the faith based um, practices along with a recovery support group seems to be what real a lot of people really need. Um, celebrate recovery is one and free indeed is another. They're very similar in their in their um, in the ways that they um, in the ways that they format their meetings, but it's a lot about it's worship, but it's also they break it break into groups and they usually have a meal. Um, and for people, especially that are in um, early recovery, they may not have um, access to a lot of meals, and this is something where they can sit down and break bread together, right? Um, one of the other things that I thought were really great about these is. Um, I know with Celebrate Recovery, and I haven't been to an actual free indeed meeting, I just know feedback that I've gotten from a lot of people that truly enjoy it, is that they break up into groups. So they have a chemical dependency group, which obviously is refers to like a substance use disorder, but they have another group called Hurts, Habits, and Hangups. And that is for anybody. That is for, that does not have to be a substance use disorder. So hurts, habits, and hangups is talking about trauma, codependency, any of those different things. And um, and you will see a lot of healing that go in those rooms that have nothing to do with substance use disorder. So if you are afflicted with all, all the above, 
you get to choose. One week you can do one, one week you can do another. But I think it's great for especially family members. Um, that is a huge thing in the community is those family members. And I haven't talked a lot about the Al-Anon and the um, adult um, alcoholics uh, or the uh, children, adult children of alcoholics. And there's actually another family support group in, um, in uh, Flint that I just learned about this yesterday at Sober or Sunday at Soberfest. But, you know, giving families a chance for them to go to meetings and groups and get the support that they need and learn how to support us without um, enabling us, right? So those support groups for the families are really important. And so that's the other thing about celebrating recovery and free indeed it's very family oriented everybody can go it's not just for the addict or alcoholic there's a place for everybody all right so this is one that's near and dear to my heart because i i was able to tap into um this type of um recovery and add it to my already amazing alcoholics anonymous family and that's holistic recovery so holistic recovery honestly what it really comes down to is it's based on the different dimensions of wellness, holistic, all-inclusive, whole body, whole life. And so we're looking at wellness in each one of those different dimensions. Um, and so it could be financial wellness or environmental wellness. It doesn't have to just be um, mind, body, spirit is what we usually say. <clears throat> so all of those things with holistic recovery and holistic recovery is being present and mindful in each one of those areas of your life. Um, and holistic is also a lot of, there's a lot of books that I've seen on alternative alternative um, uh, recovery techniques. And um, they use that as, as a lot, the words um, alternative. And so the holistic approach is based on the belief that health problems occur because you have been out of balance. There is usually more than one area of your life that is driving this imbalance. So the goal then is to restore your balance so that you not only break free of alcohol or drug addiction, but your overall system, including body, mind, and spirit, can be rejuvenated to a renewed and balanced state. And one of the things that I find that this really works really well for is people that are in those maintenance stages of recovery or even really in those earlier stages, but it gives them a, set, a, a separate set of coping skills and tools that they can use outside of a fellowship. This is really good if you are um, have some issues with the traditional faith-based things. Um, and this, this focuses more on that spirituality um, that we were talking about as far as the frameworks. Um, and uh, I really like the idea that there's so many different things that are included. So you've got art and music therapy, mindfulness and meditation, yoga and there's actually a 12 why um there's a there's an actual 12 step yoga program that a lot of places offer um reiki and which is also known as therapeutic touch you know being able for for people to find out that the healing begins inside them and it's not just what they need outside of themselves to heal themselves that letting people know through reiki and acu detox and grounding techniques breath work, all these things that they can actually do within themselves. And it empowers them that I can heal myself, that I don't have to use things outside of me, people, places, things, and situations to change the way that I feel. And it empowers people to be able to do those things. So by teaching them holistic recovery, they can add it to any pathway, or it can be the pathway of their, of their choice. Um, and so um, there's lots of different places in each area um, that has some different holistic options. But these alone, just learning about them and finding places that do them is exceptionally powerful to add people through in, into, their, um, into their recovery. Not to mention, most of these will actually help somebody in those early 90 days of detox. Um, it will help them with their detox process to be able to get through it um, much easier. Um, people have said that they've got through a non- medically monitored detox just by using some of these different things to help them control and um, control the, uh, their inside internal um, internal process of withdrawal. All right. So um, 
the LGBTQIA plus community um, is extremely high risk for um, for um, any type of addictions. And um, there's a lot of meetings that do have specific um, LGBT meetings, but um, there's not many, not in comparison as to uh, as to hetero meetings. And and I think that it's important for for us to remember that although the stigma is being reduced more and more, there is still um, there still needs to be community within a community. And I understand this on a few levels because when you have a co community like like the holistic community within the recovery community, right? Like church within the recovery community, like those specific subcategories are really important to be able to have more in common with and bond with people that have so many things that I have in common with you. And so roughly 4% of Americans identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other LGBT. Um, and the statistically at higher risk for substance use disorder development than those who identify as heterosexual. Um, my statistics um, show that gay, lesbian, and bisexual individuals are roughly 18% more likely to have an alcohol addiction and 20% more likely to have a drug use disorder and 5.9% more likely to misuse prescription medications. And so when you're talking about trauma and mental health and um, family issues, there's going to be a higher risk of, um, of substance use. And so if you check out your meeting lists um, for, for different AA and NA, Generally there, you might find like one or two meetings in a community and it's not a lot. But I did a little research on this website, the gayandsober.org. And it is a pretty exceptional little community um, of online community. And I do enjoy the fact that they have so many things outside of meetings. There's like, like community forums and things like that. And so I think this is a great addition to um, if you have any of your clients that are LGBT, and in that one meeting a week that they might get, they might get to go to, this might be something that they can tap into more often and kind of have an additional virtual set of peers um, to support them in their recovery. All right, so now we get into, I leave the best for last, right? This is the big discussion points that we, I usually have great, great discussions in most of my trainings when I get to this point. And that excites me because um, the more we're talking about it, the more that we're able to to take these perspectives inside of us and get them out there, and just and then all of us can kind of um, you know muddle through the um, perspectives of each other. So medication assisted recovery. So you'll notice that I'm calling it medication assisted recovery and not medication assisted treatment because they're two different things. Medication assist assisted treatment is that is just that it's treatment. It's treatment. What do we know about any type of substance use treatment? It, it eventually is completed, correct? Like treatment doesn't go on forever. Treatment is meant to be, is meant to sustain. Any type of treatment is meant to sustain and complete. And there is a community of people who take medication to stay, to stay clean and sober and alive that don't plan on getting off of it. And that is their recovery pathway. So knowing that it's not just a treatment, it is also a pathway. Now, there's lots of my clients have said, I'm gonna, I want to, after two years, I'm going to start getting off this. So my plan the whole time, my whole plan is to get off this. And that's great. Like that's their plan. But I also have had people where they have misused pain medication their entire life and they have chronic pain issues and they plan to never get off this. It's the only thing that they can take responsibly that will even touch their pain. And, they, and, they, and they've and found that this is what works for them. And that is their recovery pathway. So the language medication-assisted recovery is being used more often than the MAT due to they just plan to use this as a sustainable pathway. There are some clients, and like I mentioned, they cannot control their use of other pain management methods and are most confident in the accountability of managed medication. So for now is the statement I'd like for you guys to take with you today when it comes to medication-assisted recovery. 
for now is a statement used that tells the client that you support them right now, but you don't accept it for long-term use. And this is one of those stigmatizing statements that we don't mean to be so um, harsh on them and push them away from their pathway. But when we say things like, well, that's good for now, and I guess that's good, you know, that'll work for you for now, it's telling me I'm not accepting this as a recovery pathway and I'm still looking at it as treatment. And so MAR, uh, Medication Assisted Recovery, has a stigma um, that people are not really in recovery. This is traumatizing to the client who's attempting to save and rebuild their lives with less consequences. And, you know, there's several people that are, are on medication assisted that still stigmatize each other and say, you're not clean. I'm not clean. You're not clean. And so really, as we know, recovery is up to the individual. If this is what they want to do, or they either think or they're not think, then that's right for them. But the stigma that they're not in recovery is extremely harsh, especially in those abstinence-based 12-step programs, right? Like they come in there and I'm, um, I've got, you know, one year clean and I'm on Suboxone and somebody, you know, in an NA meeting is definitely so they will give them a whole lot of hassle about saying they're clean if they're still on Suboxone. But I've seen many people have very long-term recovery and never use another illicit substance um, again after getting on uh, medication. And, um, and it is, it's a huge stigma. Um, more so, I think, in the recovery community than outside of it, to be honest. Um, coordination. This is a big deal. So coordination with the client's medication provider helps to support the client's choice for their pathway. So clinicians, we can report observable behaviors and symptoms and get a better understanding of the client's treatment plan with their, with their clinic's therapist. So they, if, they're, if you have a client that's in, um, on medication and they're coming to see you in addition to their, um, their clinic's um, therapist, the really important thing is to coordinate with them. What's on their treatment plan over there? What kind of things are they saying and working on there? And what are you observing about your client? Are they nodding out? Are they missing appointments? Are they, um, are they, you know, are they in danger because you are observing some, some things about them. Being that I personally, and I'm, most of us are not, um, don't have medical degrees as well as clinical degrees, um, one of the things we need to do is we need to just report those observable symptoms. And working with the clinic and the client together, you really do are able to reduce um, a lot of those symptoms and the client ends up feeling a lot better. And so remember, we talked about um, Mara at the beginning when we talked about the um, anonymous groups. Mara is a great recovery pathway for anybody who's on um, medication assisted. Um, so some examples of the Mara are your um, are your different alcohol the alcohol use ones. The two that come to that are most popular are the Anabuse and the Naltrexone or the Vivitrol. And then for opioids, we have methadone, buprenorephrine. Now the buprenorephrine is your suboxone, your subutex, and now they have sublocade, which I had a really nice conversation with a, um, a provider that does sublocade. And they talk about when you get a sublocade shot and it's giving you buprenorephrine, that it tapers slowly towards the end of the month before you get your shot. And what I'm hearing is, is that sublocade is easier to transition off of rather than tap, rather than um, the sublingual strips, because your peaks and your, your, your peak when you first get that shot starts to come down. And then if you decide to start tapering off of it, it's much easier to get off of it. And so there's a lot going on with um, medication assisted that is really um, making a lot of difference compared to what it used to be. And then of course, we've got naltrexone or Vivitrol that comes in a pill form and a shot, and a, and a once a month shot. And then I have heard people say they're on medication assisted recovery because they use marijuana as a medication to help them stay sober. So one of the questions that I get um, asked is, do you think that psychiatric drugs are considered medication assisted recovery if they assist the clients in staying in recovery and reduce harm in their lives? 
Does anybody want to weigh in on that one? Are psychiatric dog drugs considered medication assisted recovery? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say it is. Um, I mean, to, to elaborate on it, right? If, if they have a chemical imbalance in their brain that's causing them to self-harm or do something that, um, that would be, you know, negative to them and others, right? Um, I I'm going to say yes. Yeah. And that's kind of was what I was thinking is, um, you know, this is the conversations that we've had, you know, water cooler conversations and whatnot. And, and it helps reduce the idea of what medication assisted recovery looks like when you consider how many different things um, assist us in staying sober. And if you have somebody who's dual diagnosed, like you were mentioning, and um, they have found that um, trying to stabilize their mental health and not their recovery doesn't do anything. And trying to stabilize their substance use disorder and not their mental health doesn't work either. And so seeing that these clients need to use an, um, medication to stabilize their mental health and do an addiction pro, um, treatment program or pathway to sustain their recovery is where it's at. And so for, for people to be able to take a look at the Suboxone the Vivitrol, the the um the methadone. If you were able to look at it in the same light, would it reduce the stigma? And sometimes it's not so much us. I think is we've become very competent and culturally competent to the to the world of medication assisted recovery. But a lot of times our clients are not. And being able to help them see that this is an acceptable form of of recovery, that it's okay that if you are you know if you need to use medication to sustain your recovery, that there's, that it's an actual program. It's a legitimate program. You're not just using it as a crutch. Um, and so there's us stigmatizing it. And then there's also the client stigmatizing it as well. Megan. Um, just to play devil's advocate in a sense, like if you are, um, if you have a mental health disorder and you're on mental health medication, wouldn't you just be, um, sort of fulfilling that um, the third ACM dimension, just getting that on par. Yeah, absolutely. So, so so if you're if you're just meeting that ACM dimension, then it's not necessarily um, a form of treatment like you're suggesting. Well, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to, I wouldn't consider it a, an actual pathway to recovery. What I wanted to do is kind of compare the fact that that if we accept um, the mental health meds, and yes, you're right, like in that third dimension, getting them mentally stable is part of the entire process. They're physically stable, they're mentally stable, their lifestyle, you know, basic needs are met. Um, and so being able to add that all together and taking a look at, at the stigmatizing um, area of medication, of using um, medication assisted recovery, and then looking at it the same way that we do our psychiatric medications and just kind of helping reduce the stigma in that way. And it looked like Nelson was going to say something and then she'll leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because see, I, I manage, I, I manage a sober living house. I used to manage nine houses for the guys. Now, um, because I experience where these guys uh, I'll start feeling good on their medication and that sort of stuff. And that's why it's highly important for us to inform them that um, they have to take it on a continuous basis, right? Uh, and sometimes they, they, they cut it short. So um, the probability of relapse now just rises. Um, and I've seen many people um, you know, neglect their psych medication because at one point they were feeling good and then they stop and then they relapse and then they go to jail and it just, the list goes on. Um, and that's as recovery coaches, it, it's good to have that kind of knowledge and to inform the individuals, the importance of, of, of taking that medication. So. Yeah. It's kind of like what got you sober, right? Going to meetings, taking my meds. And then you stop going to meetings 
and you, you're at risk for relapse. Just like if I stop taking my meds, I'm at risk for relapse. Anything that got me sober, I should, should probably keep doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Shalita. I was pretty much going to say the same thing. And it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Right. Are you going to treat the mental health or the substance use? Well, you don't know because we don't know if the mental health is what trigger the substance use or the substance use trigger the mental health. But my whole thing is when I speak to the individuals that I service, it's harm reduction. So if you're going to trade your uh, desire to use um, opioids or whatnot for MAR treatment, then I'm totally supportive. And like you mentioned, a lot of times they just want to hear from a peer, somebody with lived experience that, hey, this is totally okay, because we're in a, a community, unfortunately, where people don't accept that type of treatment. And they will go into these meetings and they will be told or shunned for using, you know, uh, MAR treatment. So as peers, you know, if we say, hey, I'm not biased to one, but if that is what's working for you, you've traded that for this, well, not even trade it, but you're using this and it's keeping you clean and sober. Okay, that's fine. Now you're having cravings to use, to have a beer or to use crack when you were using heroin. Okay, that's fine. And and you find the old schoolers that are in these meetings, when you mention things like that harm reduction, they say, no, no, that's not right. And they want to argue about it. And it's like, well, hey, I've been doing this for over 20 years too. And I understand what you're saying, but now we have to step into the new millennium. It's like the new Testament versus the old Testament. So I'm totally in support of it. That's awesome. Thank you. And I think that's one of the reasons why these multiple pathways um, are so important is because we are not going to get a bunch of old timers who've been in Alcoholics Anonymous for 45 years to be okay with you taking Suboxone. And, and it's not really their job. That's the pathway. It's designed to be an absence-based pathway. But to be able to offer our clients all these different um, options that they are going to be comfortable in. And, um, and then one day they may find that abstinence is for them and they find their way into those pathways. Crystal. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's my take on that. If it's somebody really involved, like I'm, um, I consider myself a, a, a NA girl, right? I, I believe in the program. I'm not a, a, a product of treatment. I'm a product of having a thoroughly whoop behind in spirit. And I went in there and I made a meeting, and I've been there for 22 years. And so my take on that. In, in the steps and as well as our traditions, which isn't really talked about a whole, whole lot, but I had some good people placed in my life to teach me and I was willing to learn about. And in our tradition, it states, if you come in there, as long as your only reason for being there is a desire, right? So I'm one of them people and I, I, uh, I advocate for the person who comes in that's on the box because our traditions state that, that's considered the outside issue. So it, it don't have anything. And I'm one of them people, they really sometimes call me the NA police, right? Because I, I stick up for the traditions as well as the steps, right? Because the traditions were put in place. And thank God for Al Alcoholics Anonymous, because without them, we wouldn't have had a platform to right. get on. We just brought, in, and this talks about, the, I ain't making this stuff up. It's in the literature. Yep. Look we broaden the perspective right that's all inclusive so i'm one of those people who bang the drum for the person who comes in that's on suboxone because in my experience i've seen people come in and they'd be like oh okay so total abstinence but they have to be have the opportunity to be there and feel free and feel protected and not judged that they're in the right place. I think that's why a whole lot of they formed those other fellowships, like what was that? Uh, Fellowship Anonymous for people who was using heroin and they came in with the, and they was on the meth. And so they kind of like branched off and went and got their own, started their own fellowship. But if we all inclusive, then that means we take anybody that comes in and say, yeah. I want some help. Yeah. You know, and if you're willing to do what we've done and these are the steps you have to be willing to take. That's kind of like how it goes. So yes. the, the a whole point is the idea is, is changing and people Absolutely. are becoming a little more open, but it takes people with information and who's willing to stand up for the, the, the traditions that were formulated to protect us 
from ourselves, right? That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, so we can't control, we we are going to hopefully be those people in the community that, that help reduce and smash that stigma. But until that happens, we can't protect our clients from walking into an AA meeting or an NA meeting on Suboxone and not being stigmatized. What we can do is offer them options. And that's so that's right. what this training was about, is instead of trying to change the local NA meeting to accept your Suboxone, why don't we introduce you to Mara? Why don't we introduce you to Smart Recovery? Why don't we introduce you to Celebrate Recovery? And give them all options where they can go somewhere and they can feel comfortable. And knowing that those other pathways are always available and you can combine as many as you want. So I really appreciate your guys' engagement and involvement today. Um, I really hope that you got something out of it. And I know that um, Alicia wanted uh, to give us all a chance to kind of discuss, ask any questions, um, and have any types of feedback or discussion on the training or anything else in um, regards to multiple pathways. Okay, but well, great job and thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you guys have anything that you guys want to present to Nicole or just speak about, feel free to go ahead and do so here before we kind of close out. Um, yeah, Shalita, go ahead. I just want to add, um, like Nicole shared, I too, I didn't like, I, if you may have paid attention to me say that I worked in substance use and I was using alcohol and marijuana, but it was going to work showing up every day that I heard you know, some of the reasons why I wanted to change. And it wasn't until I took the CCAR certification and I saw the film at the end and I saw that this thing is bigger than Saginaw, Flint, Detroit. It's bigger than Michigan. It's bigger than the United States. When they freaking have the, the celebrate the celebrations in, in the Soberfest over in, in the Australia and China and all these places, I thought this is bigger than us. And this is something that I want to be a part of I want to be a part of this healing thing when it's big and people recognize and it's not something to be embarrassed about that I can say I've been a part of that too. So mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add that and we can keep promoting that to the people that we service and tell them, hey, there's nothing to be ashamed about and embarrassed about. This is the thing for us to take by the horns and say, I survived this. Absolutely. Love that. That's awesome. And, and I think that's what the neat thing about virtual international meetings of all kinds are. Um, is being able to really feel that global, that global fellowship that, you know, the lady that I ta talked to in Ireland, who's has sit, feels the same way about recovery as I do. And it just makes us feel like we're a part of something so big. Because when you're an addict and alcoholic, you feel like you're in a, in a class that that is, that's under, you know, under everybody else, we're less than and we're like that, we're like, you know, that, that uh, stigmatized society. And, it's nice to be about, about about something that's so big. Nelson. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Um, yeah, I, I I asked my uh, my my supervisor for multiple pathways. I you know when I when I, you know I'm old school, so um, the only thing that was at least uh, prevalent back then was religion, and then Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, you know, with this new generation and everything, it's just to have choices is, is just wonderful. You know, I, I think, I think that's wonderful because it, it'll appeal to a broader audience. Right. Um, it was always forced on me by the courts and that sort of stuff. And of course that's where my recovery had started. And I was biased about me medication <clears throat> treatment. Right. I thought, oh, well, that's not being clean. You're, that's just a legal way to get high and that sort of stuff. And there's some abuse there. But if it improves um, uh, their lives, um, then who am I to say? Only because, you know, with with some of the uh, success stories that I've had, uh, a lot of the guys on Suboxone didn't quite make it. Um, but these are extreme cases. But uh, I, I've heard many, many stories that medication assistant treatment has helped a great deal of people. So I having choices to me, I'm, I'm stoked about it. I'm ready to pass on the word. I'm going to do some studying here. And the more the merrier, right? We're trying to save lives here. Yes. They say that um, there's a huge percentage that, uh, that uh, we cannot help those, the, the, those people that die. We no longer get a chance. 
to, to do anything for them. There's nothing more we can do. And so if they are still using and they're on Suboxone or if they're abusing it, you know, understand like if they don't die, we have a chance. We mm -hmm. have a chance of helping them. And there are so many different harm reductions out there, um, you know, that, that we use all the time. Um, and it's not gonna, you know, your seatbelt is not gonna prevent a car accident, but, but it could, it, it will prevent you from dying. And so giving these guys a chance to do something different. And yes, there's a huge stigma on the list of people that you've all heard about that um, abuse their, their medications, didn't, didn't stop using. But it's funny, those people that are recovering and doing awesome and like living amazing lives, you don't hear about them because they're just like all of us out there living lives. They just yeah. take, they just take a strip of, a uh, strip of paper with their morning vitamins, and then mm -hmm. that's it. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. So, I hope it doesn't. And please, as you go through the PowerPoint, when you get the PowerPoint, if you are able to click on those links, explore, and maybe even attend yeah. some of those meetings that you can't imagine what that is. Like, check it out, and and it may not be for you, and a lot of them probably won't be but you'll be able to know the client that that would work really good for when they come in your office, right? So yeah, a lot of, a lot of great information, um, participation and engagement was absolutely wonderful. Um, we greatly appreciate Nicole for, for sharing her PowerPoint and uh, all of you guys for attending. Um, great turnout, super exciting. Um, we've got a lot more coming. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to put in the chat, there's going to be a link. Um, if you guys don't mind clicking on that link, um, it's going to take you to a survey. After you're done completing the survey, um, it will allow you guys to upload um, a certificate for, for this information. Um, if you want the PowerPoint, uh, go ahead, put it in the email if you already haven't, um, and let me know. I'll get the PowerPoint out to you guys. Um, also, uh, anti-stigma at odysseyvillage.com is our website. Any questions, concerns, anything at all, feel free to email that. Um, we'll, we'll respond, um, you know, within a timely fashion. We've got this ongoing monthly. Um, the next presentation is going to be August 15th. That is going to be with Mr. Kenneth Jones. Um, it is going to be called Peaks and Troughs, Desire, Cravings, and Pursuit. Um, there will be a flyer created for that. We're going to be sending out the emails like we did for this one. I'm not quite sure how everybody was able to, to access the information to this, but we've got it out on LinkedIn. Um, it's going to be on our Facebook page. We're sending emails out. If you guys know anybody that might want to participate, please share as the emails come out. Um, I've got a list of everybody e uh, everybody's emails. I'll be sending, um, if that is okay with everybody, uh, another email out for the next um, series. But like I said, this is ongoing every month, the third Tuesday of every month, same time, um, a different presentation every single time. So I'm going to put that in the chat box right now. So that link that I just threw up will be the link to get your certificate and participate in that survey. survey. Um, so we can kind of get a general idea of, of how this went over today. Um, once again, any questions, anti-stigma at odysseyvillage.com. Check us out on Facebook. Um, our phone number, feel free to call, email, however you guys want to get a hold of us. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much. If anybody has anything they want to say, please feel free, open it up. Um, if not, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. I'm going to put my I'm going to put my email in the chat as well. If anybody has any questions or or um, needs some resources, I am huge about networking. Um, there's a Facebook group called Recovery Coach Networking in Michigan. So for those of you who are coaches, um, there's about 800 coaches in Michigan that all just kind of network together so that we can make sure our clients get the resources that they need. So you're welcome to join there. But if you have any other questions, you're welcome to give me a call. And nice job, Alicia. Thanks, guys. You guys are all appreciated. Thank you again so much. You guys have an awesome day. Hey, you too. See you later.